Thank you, honey. So I'd be the last one to say that I stand up here in a silo. I um, stand on the shoulder of giants, huge people, literally, who have paved the way for all of us to be in this room learning about a new paradigm of healthcare. For me, the names are Gladys McGarry, who at the age of 99 is still telling me how to practice integrative health in medicine. Robert Anderson, Gladys, and the founders of the American Holistic Medical Association. Lee Lipsenthal, ABIHM, my colleague here, Wendy Werner, Dave Perlmutter. There are so many visionaries, Mark Hyman and Jeff Bland, and the list goes on and on and on. So I'm not, you know, I don't claim any, any greatness, and I'm not sure where Tabby got any of those pictures other than Rowney King, who's really the wind beneath my wings and has been working with me uh, for over 25 years with some of the things that we've been told are crazy, crazy, crazy to only come today uh, to see that we're not, weren't so crazy, we were just a little bit ahead of our time. And I remember in 1990, oh, what was it, 1996, when I went to Scripps and I said, I want to do advanced lipid testing. Anyone remember the Berkeley Heart Lab here? We have anyone as old as me, right? Vance Lipid Testing, Berkeley, they said, you can't practice that Rolls Royce medicine. And so today I sort of smile and laugh when everybody orders advanced lipid testing. Uh, 17 years ago, when we proposed a natural supplements conference, uh, we were told, um, who would go to a conference like that? And Scripps decided they wouldn't do it, so we took it across the street to UCSD, and they said, okay, we'll do it. And when 350 people showed up, Scripps said, maybe next year we'll do that conference, right? Uh, you know, there's just so many stories, and it's just a reminder to all of us to not give up, to keep going, especially when we have uh, things like, gee, we're not going to give Dr. Guarneri CME, her talk. We're not going to give Jeff Bland's talk CME. We're not going to give Mark Hyman's talk. See, do you see any patterns here? Right. So are we going to tolerate that and say, I'm not going to go to that talk because there's no CME? Are we going to say, to heck with that, I'm going to that conference anyway, just to stand in solidarity with my colleagues who are saying we need to change. So today... Today, I'm going to call for the impeachment of ACCME and the way we are currently doing business. Because I, I've been told I can say what I want, which is a dangerous thing, since it's no longer CME, and Woody, you will regret this. <laughs> so uh, my love to Woody, you have been pushing this ball as long as I have only you're a little grayer than I am, and I can tell you why. <laughs> and Dr. Parker in the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, by the way, please come down and visit us and come and say hello to our booth over at the Academy. We'd love to talk to you. So today, I have the great opportunity to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is the interrelationship of planetary health and people health. And Ironically, I made a proposal after my first book, The Heart Speaks, in 2006 to Simon & Schuster, and they said, we want you to write another book. And I said, well, I want to talk about the health of people and the health of the planet. And what did they say to me in 2006? No one wants to read that. <laughs> I said, okay, well, I'll come up with something else. And, and I didn't do it, and so on and so forth. But it's been a passion of mine for a really long time. And as Tabby said, I started out here in the cardiac cath lab, and I'll be perfectly honest, in the 1990s when I was fixing these six saponous vein grafts, and you can see this person's had a bypass by the wires in their chest, I never asked a simple question, why is someone who's had a bypass come back now with new blockage in their arteries, right? You would think after you've had a bypass, you would sort of uh, say, let me... Uh, eat the twigs and nuts and things like that. I'm never going to go through that again. But no, uh, people forget. And uh, this was my toolbox in the 90s. 
and I would do whatever I could to open up coronary arteries. And guess what? I thought I was curing cardiovascular disease, right? Never occurred to me in the 90s that I was fixing 12, 13, or 16 millimeters of an artery and the rest of the blood vessels from the tips of the toes to the top of the head, I was doing nothing for. But this is, how, this is what I was raised to think. Now, many of us, of course, know what conventional medicine is good at, but it took me a time to recognize it. You know, we're great. If you get run over by a truck, that's a really good time to say, let me get to a trauma center, right? It's probably not the time to say, maybe, you know, I'll do some aromatherapy right now. I mean, you know, do it when you come out of the OR. I mean, we know there's a time and place, but the bottom line is Western medicine's good in acute care. And that acute care model cannot be extrapolated to promoting health. You do not promote health by a mammogram. You do not promote health by giving somebody 16 different drugs, right? You promote health by doing the work we're doing in this room right now, which is learning about how we create health, right? Through things like good sleep and nutrition and mind-body practices and, by and large, cleaning up this planet. Uh, because everything else is window dressing if we don't do something about that now. So despite the 400,000 bypasses and millions of stents that go in, you know, the World Health Organization tells us, well, yeah, three in 10 deaths will still be from cardiovascular disease. And guess what? 80% of these can be preventable. So I always ask this question. I invite you to think about it. We have the science of disease. Everybody's quick to say, Take this pill, it will help your acid. Take this pill, it will lower your cholesterol. We also have a science of health. And why are we not taking the applications and the data of that science of health and actually practicing it, right? That's the big question. So we know we have health challenges in the United States and in the world. I mean, the Global Burden of Disease Summary, which came out three years ago, is telling us now that the Western diseases of being overfed and undernourished, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, are now the, and uh, insulin resistance are the top diseases for the world. Childhood malnutrition dropped down from number one to number five. And we, for the first time, have, these are not Republican states in red, although some of them are Republican, you know. These purple states, which is kind of scary, have greater than 35% of the population as obese. And I know, without a doubt, it's not as simple as saying that everybody's just home, supersizing meals, eating Cinnabons, and not moving. It's also connected to the health of the planet, and we'll see that few minutes. We know that we have 1.5 million deaths related to diabetes uh, since 2012, and this number is just escalating. And it's 10% of the adult population. So what we're talking about, you know, maybe we should do affordable care, or maybe we should have universal health care. To me, it's almost like we're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic right now, right? 50% by 2030 will have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I find it shocking that patients show up in my office and I say, okay, let's talk about your health challenges. They have a fatty liver. Oh, do you know what that means? No. Do you know how you got it? No. Right? Insulin resistance in the liver. You know, so these, these are the things that healthcare is not going to be able to um, pay for anymore. So let's go back to 2005. Olshansky said this, the next generation will be the first in recorded history to be younger and sicker than their parents, a public health catastrophe. We're seeing that now. And we're seeing one out of three children, according to the CDC, born after 2000 will develop diabetes in their lifetime. So our work, we can't give up. We can't worry about whether we're getting a CME or we're not. We have to keep doing the work and my dream and I'll plant it out there, is that each and every one of us, every clinician, someday marches on Washington and demands that we need to deal with this problem and we're not going to deal with it with pharmaceuticals alone. 
we have to change, we have to change the paradigm. How dare they? The average American takes four drugs. We have over 100,000 deaths a year. How, how dare we keep doing what we're doing? Now, Mark talked about KFOSs, right? So we have, I call this good intentions, dangerous consequences. Let's look at our food supply for a second, right? So it's not so simple, I'm just eating the Cinnabons. There's only so many Cinnabons you could eat a day, right? But our intention was to have a lot of animals and feed the world and industrialize food system. I'm not putting it down. It's how we're doing things, which Mark pointed out in the last talk. Is it degenerative or is it regenerative? So this is a typical KFOS. What goes on there? The animals have limited access to the outdoors. They're one on top of the other. They're pooping and peeing on top of each other. And they're being fed hormones, so they're big and fat. And they're being fed antibiotics even if they're not sick. So when my patients say to me, I want to eat meat, I say, well, if you want to eat meat, then you have to tell me what the animal ate, right? Because it's all, all connected. The average U.S. farm uses about three kilocalories of fossil energy to produce one kilocalorie of energy from beef. So while I agree with regenerative farming practices 100%, uh, you'll see that I still believe that we should be eating a lot less meat. Uh, one of the largest subsidies of federal agricultural uh, money goes to cattle ranches to graze on private land. So do you know where your tax dollars are going? What is your tax money funding? Are you funding the agricultural industry? Are you funding the dairy industry? Um, I think we have a right to know. And I certainly would like to know because we spend $500 million a year on federal grazing programs. That's what it costs taxpayers. I'd like to see some of that money go into our school systems. Now, good intentions. We're going to get farmers working again. We're going to get farms going again. But what do we get farms going to do? Monocultures. I only grow corn. I only grow soy. What is the problem with that? Well, the obvious one is we have so much corn, we don't know what to do with it, so what do we do with it? Yeah, turn it into high fructose corn syrup and put it in everything. But there are some other issues. We're eroding biodiversity. We, in order to grow monocultures, we have land that's filled with pesticides and fertilizers. And by the way, all those pesticides and fertilizers get washed down when, it, when we have these heavy rains into the drinking water, into the ocean water, and so on. So we're consuming water at crazy rates. And then when you go into the medical literature, take a look at the World Health Organization's biggest, one of their biggest concerns, antibiotic resistance. Now, some of this is the reflex. Gee, doc, I have a, a tickle in my throat. Take an antibiotic, right? There's this knee-jerk reflex. Take an antibiotic. There is an element of that. But the other element is we're seeing farm workers who work on farms that have animals that are fed antibiotics that are coming in with antibiotic-resistant bugs, right? Based on their exposure to what's happening on the land. So it's much more, it's all connected in a much bigger way than some of us imagine. So atrazine, which is banned in other parts of the world, you can buy it on Amazon.com. It has been uh, used extensively since the 1960s, and there is good research suggesting that it is associated with insulin resistance and obesity. And if you want to really get creative, you could start looking at the obesity maps and the highest atrazine use maps. And at least in this quite insightful study, the highest areas of atrazine use also had the highest areas of obesity. Right? So I just invite you to look at what these pesticides and herbicides are doing, persistent organic pollutants linked to mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance. Right? Drinking water that has arsenic in it. Chickens that have arsenic. Rice that has arsenic in it, right? 
associated with circulatory diseases, kidney disease, diabetes, and so on. So I'm not saying all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the bad news first. I'm gonna give you the good news later. I mean, that's the reality. There are many things that we can do. I'll come back to this in a minute. But our solution to this has been to create these silos, which I call the ologies, right? Patients go from ology to ology. Today I go to cardiology, tomorrow I'll see neurology, I'll go to nephrology next week. They have different drugs and tests from each silo, and there's no systemic approach to anything. Has anyone experienced this, right? This is siloed thinking. This is not functional medicine. This is not integrative medicine. It's not holistic medicine. It's not breaking down these silos is critically important to what we do, not only in working together, but breaking down these silos and saying, I'm a cardiologist. Inflammation causes heart disease. Inflammation, for most people, usually begins in the gut, right? So I've had to become a gastroenterologist. Right? I have to treat the whole person, right? I can't, we can't work in these ologies because when we work in these ologies, we work like this. Oh, my knee hurts, you know. We say, ah, I know what you have. You have osteoarthritis. I'm going to give you an NSAID, right? And you say, oh, every time I eat, I get heartburn. I know what you have. You have acid reflux. I'm going to give you a protonics. Oh, look at your cholesterol, it's high. I'm gonna give you a statin. Oh, by the way, you have diabetes. I'm gonna give you metformin. And I am not against pharmaceuticals when needed. But what I teach my patients is, if someone says you have something, if they label you with something, I want you to say, why do I have it? Because the work of integrative medicine is about the why. It's how, if we say why, then we can say, what are the right nutrients, nutraceuticals, nutrition, is sleep, is stress, is sleep apnea, is uh, persistent organic pollutants, what's involved in the why that's creating this health challenge? And then, of course, you know, the, the depression, well, yeah, I'm depressed because I probably have five drugs and uh, not a lot of hope, so I'm, I'm going to give you something for that, too. And you can think about depression as a perfect example because you think everyone is depressed for the same reasons. You know, some people may have a SNP that's affecting dopamine. Yeah, some, that could be true, and we can check for that. Some people may live in an altitude where it's dark and they have seasonal affective disorder. Someone's depression may be because their dog just died. It may be situational. Are we going to treat it all the same way? And I think we know the answer to that is no. But this ill-to-the-pill approach is where we have gone. And I tell all of my fellows at the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, I don't want you to go from the ill-to-the-pill to the sick-to-the-supplement, right? I don't think you're an integrative medicine doc because you can say, oh, I'm not going to give you statin, I'm going to give you Reggie's rice. I'm not going to give you an aspirin, I'm going to give you willow, white willow right? I'm not going to give you protonics. I'm going to give you slippery elm. It's nice that you know that, but I want you to go deeper. I want you to go under, open the hood up and take a look and say, what kind of nutrition program should this person be on? What's going on uh, with their micronutrients? What do they need to correct this problem while we're busy giving them drugs or supplements? Uh, so I think I stole this a long time ago from Mark Hyman, if I remember correctly. And uh, this is the reality of it, poly pills for poly ills. I mean, that's, that's what we have going on today. And take a look at the money. This is a pharmaceutical industry and gross domestic product. Uh, we are number one on top of any other country. And the uh, developed nation study just ranked the United States in health outcomes at the lowest. We ranked lowest. Take a look at uh, the healthy country study. Kind of scary. And the cost of health care is huge. So if you look at the countries on the left, I don't know if I have a pointer here. I'm going to try this. Yeah, so countries here are UK and uh, Scandinavian countries. Down here is Mexico. This is money spent. This is life expectancy. So here's the UK with a straight line going to about 80 years old. Here's money spent in the United States. And here we come. And where do we, so where are we spending our money? 
Are we spending our money on pharmaceuticals? Are we spending our money on surgeries that could have been prevented? Are we, when we did the Ornish research in the 1990s, we demonstrated for every dollar we spent on lifestyle change, we saved $6.66 on bypass and angioplasty. And that's why Medicare covers the Ornish program today, because of that work. Now, the Lancet, uh, if you have not looked at the Lancet's climate change reports, they are very uh, much worth reading. And this was uh, one of the quotes, which said, climate change is the largest health threat in the 21st century. But they also went on to say this, and this is the hope part. It is also the biggest public health opportunity we have. So I don't think this is a medical system issue. This is a public health issue. Anything great that has ever been achieved in advancing medicine forward, whether you believe in vaccinations or not, hygiene, germ theory, sanitation, has it come out of a healthcare system or has it come out of public health? Public health. Public health is the answer here. So the world's poor are going to be the ones that are going to suffer the most. Everyone will suffer. Everyone will suffer, and I will tell you, the planet will be here, and we may not. And that's the reality of it. Everybody's talking about, oh, the planet's going to implode. The planet's not imploding. Whether we can sustain life on a planet that has food security issues, drought, water that's not clean, diarrhea illnesses, viral illnesses, extreme heat, the heat wave in Europe killed 70 thousand people. One heat wave, right? This, this is the challenge. This is where we have to, have to, have to support whatever it is that transforms climate health. And I don't have to tell you to take a look around the United States. Wildfires up in the Northwest, California, we've had more fires than we know what to do with. Drought, we have floods, Mississippi is flooding, we have excess rain, we have hurricanes and cyclones. And every one of these has an impact because if you look at the 28 report on the Lancet Countdown on Health, you start to see things like this. Vector-borne diseases are on the rise. Why? Because as the climate is warmer, the mosquito hatching is longer diseases of the tropics begin to move north. This is why we're starting to see things like Zika and West Nile and Dengue. And by the way, if you are not an expert in these things, you may want to become an expert in these things. And you may want to become a mold expert as well, because what we're seeing is all this flooding, like we saw in Katrina, leading to tons of mold-related illnesses and environmental related illnesses. So respiratory illnesses, increased pollen, particulate matter. We, World Health Organization tells us 7 million deaths a year are attributed to air pollution. And what's even scarier, they named air pollution an independent risk factor for stroke. Right? And there are places in the world today where people are advised, do not go outside, the air is not safe. So that may be Santiago, Chile. It may be uh, Beijing, China. It may be Delhi, India. But I can tell you, we're all breathing the same air. Right? Don't, don't think that's somebody's problem over there. It's our problem right over here. And this is the healthcare footprint, carbon footprint in blue, uh, by the National Health Service in England. But one of the highest carbon footprints is coming from the healthcare industry. So how do I put it together? This is how I put it together. We pay our taxes, which subsidizes the U.S. Farm Bill. Uh, this is where the subsidies go. So you have agriculture, grazing, and dairy. Up here at the tippy, tippy tip, you have legumes, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, so we have a food industry, which Mark already beautifully showed you, is making us sick. But it doesn't have to make us sick because we can choose differently and we can have consumer-related power 
for conscious capitalism that can force the issue that's going to change this. But we also know that the agricultural industry is part of the methane greenhouse gas effect. There's no doubt about it. It is part of it. And so our solution is the ill to the pill. We're going to continue to give people drugs when they get sick. Oh, but by the way, the pharmaceutical industry has this huge greenhouse gas effect as well. Again, the whole thing impacting human health, right? So we have to break the cycle. And integrative medicine sits here. Everything we have to offer is going to transform the health of this country. Because at the end of the day, I don't know if any of you went down to see the Oculus by the World Trade Center, that really cool building that's a phoenix, looks like a phoenix rising. We are the phoenix rising because we are the only ones right now who know how to create health. We are the only ones who know how to teach people to transform their stress response to bring together people in community, and every skill set you have right now is going to come to fruition in a powerful way. Because this part of the equation, I mean, we need the drugs when we need them, but they can no longer be a way of life. And the government, the world, the globe realizes it's not sustainable. And this whole process here is not sustainable for health. So while we're taking down uh, some of the silos, this is a silo we need to impact, the pharmaceutical industry. We need to impact the way we're doing our agricultural practices, which you heard Mark talk about, and so on. And it's a lot of work, and it's all doable. Because for the first time in the history of the world, we had a country go to the seed bank. Do you know we have a seed bank that all the seeds of the world are put in uh, Norway? We had one country request a deposit of seeds. Those seeds are supposed to be there in case there's a huge disaster and we have to repopulate the world's food supply. Syria requested seeds. I think we have stooped to a new low. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm having a hard time tolerating it. And for the first time ever, we now have climate refugees. Bangladesh, the Maldives, Venice, Louisiana, it's all around. People can't go home. People have been displaced from their homes. And by the way, that has a huge psychological impact. People have lost their homes. They've lost their family, lost family members, have to move away from everything they know. And it's real. The children in Bangladesh, because they've been flooded out so many times that the land is underwater more than it's above water, they decided to put the schools for the children, computers, libraries, everything, on floating boats, OK? Where are these millions and millions of people in Bangladesh going to go? Here's a small example. Tuvalu is a small eight island atoll. And they went to New Zealand and they said, look, we have 11,600 people here. We're going underwater. Will you take us? Will you give us New Zealand citizenship? And New Zealand said, yes, we will. How many people are familiar with the nascent passport? No one's this old. So after World War I, Europe was totally ripped apart, and people were displaced all over Europe, particularly 800,000 Russians who were told, you can't come back to Russia, you're an expat, you can't come back in. People had no country. So nascent, who uh, probably should get some sort of Nobel Prize, was an Arctic explorer and a Norwegian statesman. He said, this is not acceptable. So he convinced uh, the League of Nations to create something called the Nason Passport, which is a passport given to someone who's a refugee and has no country. And basically, it was a passport that allowed them to go to any country of their choosing. Now, do we 
over 600,000 nation passports went out. So the question is, do we need to bring back the nation passport for our climate refugees? Again, where do people go? Well, I believe that spiritual leaders uh, come around every now and again to remind us of our humanity, right? And that spiritual leader may be the Dalai Lama, right? And in this case, it's Pope Francis. And I don't know if any of you have read Praise Be to You or Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home. And he said this, we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social. And I'll say social as healthcare being part of that, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. The same mindset, the same mindset that stands in the way of making radical decisions. I think we need some radical decisions right now to reverse the trend of global warming also stands in the way of achieving the goal of eliminating poverty, right? So we need to go to people who live at a level of higher consciousness and hear their wisdom. And I can tell you right now, it's not on the news stations, in my humble opinion. So in integrative medicine, uh, we know that 70 to 90% of the diseases we see are related to the environment, related to lifestyle. Genes are important, but they're at the tip of the iceberg. We teach you are more than your genes, right? Epigenetics has taught us we can turn, upregulate genes and downregulate genes and transform someone's health response. And the environment is not only the physical environment, it's also the environment you live in, the people you eat with, your tribe, the people you're connected to, and so on. So we know it's much more complicated than just saying, gee, I'm going to give statin therapy, and I'm going to fix that one hole in the roof, like Dale Bredesen says, and I'm going to let the other 20 holes keep leaking, right? And we know that the impact on our genes leading to chronic disease is related to lifestyle. So the solution here is really lifestyle medicine. And laid on top of lifestyle medicine is when we bring in our nutraceuticals and we bring in our pharmaceuticals. And at the top of the pyramid is those fancy tests like MRIs. There's something called a therapeutic order. And we have taken the therapeutic order and we flipped it over. Right? And only we can change it back. And, and part of it is about educating ourselves, because when I went to medical school, I didn't learn anything about this. The reality is, you've seen this. Our genes haven't changed. Our environment has changed. And the American Medical Association, the AMA, is smart enough to know this. They said this, more attention needs to be paid to the economic and regulatory policies that encourage the production of unhealthy, non-sustainable food at low, immediate financial cost to consumers. They know cheap food isn't necessarily good food, at least the way we package it in this country right now, at the expense of poorer health outcomes that cost far more to treat with medications and procedures than investments in healthy food. So if the American Medical Association can say this, why are we still serving Ensure on every hospital tray? I mean, common sense. This is just, I mean, we need to, we're, all, we're aligned with the American Medical Association. Who knew? So I believe we're at a tipping point. I truly believe we are at a tipping point. And the tipping point looks like this. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are calling for an end to poverty, zero hunger, and here's our sweet part good health and well-being for all. These are the sustainable development goals. Clean water, affordable, clean energy, sustainable cities, climate action. So again, we have the American Medical Association 
we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and we have a roadmap which was beautifully created for us by the National Health Service, where they said, we need to move from healthcare as an institution-led service to healthcare and health as part of the community, right? Communities need to be healthy. We need to move from fixing and curing, treating disease after it occurs, to early intervention and prevention. Again, our sweet spot. We need to move from single indicators and out-of-date measurements. In the 90s, I was called to the head of research at Scripps Clinic. And he said, what exactly are you doing? I said, what is the problem, Dr. So-and-so? You're studying heart patients using yoga, meditation, exercise, vegetarian diet, and group support. Four things. How do you know what's working? I said, well, with all due respect, I can't tell a heart patient they can't be vegetarian. I can't tell a heart patient they can't exercise or that they shouldn't eat, you know, or that they shouldn't meditate. And by the way, you can't go to a support group to deal with your depression, your stress, your anxiety, your trauma of being in this bloody healthcare system, right? I said, it's an integrative approach. It's not a reductionist approach, right? In healthcare today, we don't get paid as physicians for our outcomes. Right? We get paid for how many pacemakers we put in, how many stents we put in. I, get a, I got a call from the hospital when I was still at Scripps, and they said, oh, by the way, we don't think you need hospital privileges. I'm a cardiologist. I need hospital privileges. Why would you say I don't need hospital? You don't admit anyone. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. Don't you think you should be saying, hey, Dr. G, why aren't you admitting anyone to the hospital? Maybe something's going on in that, what they used to call Dr. Guarneri's cult. They didn't call it the Arnish program. They used to call it, maybe something's going on in that cult over there where they're doing things a little differently. So we need meaningful scorecards in real time. We need to look at outcomes. We need to look at creation of health. Uh, we are uh, isolated and segregated as opposed to working together in partnership, which has been one of our charges with the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. We need to go from sickness to creating health. So I always tell my patients, I don't treat disease. I create health. And if you're here to create health, we're going to create health. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and we're going to do it in communities. You know, hospitals, well, we have the Accountable Care Act, and we have to take care of this many lives. What about the whole community, right? How do we have healthy communities, and how do we build healing environments? Well, also on our side is the World Health Organization. World Health Organization traditional medicine strategy says this. Strate this strategy aims to support member states in developing proactive policies and implementing plans that strengthen the role of traditional medicine in keeping populations healthy. So we have the American Medical Association. We have the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. We have the World Health Organization, and we're still we're still not getting where we need to go. And we can only do this together. So we need to change the way we think. We need to go from a biomechanical to a systems thinking, get out of the silos, treat the whole person. You guys know this, body, mind, emotions, and spirit. We need to move from hierarchies to collaboration, from waste to sustainability. I'll show you some examples of this creating health, quality of life, not just quantity of life. And I'm going to go as far, and the guys, don't be upset with me, but we need to shift it from a patriarchy to a matriarchy. <laughs> right? And, and, we're going to, and we can do this together. And we need to follow the tenets of ecologic medicine, which says the first goal of medicine is to establish the conditions for health and wholeness to prevent disease and illness. The second goal of medicine is to cure. The earth is also the clinician's client. Humans are part of a local 
ecosystem. This is the definition of ecologic medicine. Disturbing an ecosystem can affect the health and well-being of humans. Have we disturbed our ecosystem of clean air? Have we disturbed our oceans with plastic? Have we disturbed our water supply? Do you know there are at least 95 EPA rollbacks over the last two and a half years? Take a look at the EPA rollbacks. And if that's not enough to make all of us start screaming, I don't know what is. Stream water, wetland water, riverbeds are no longer considered to be under government protection as of January 2020. It's just not acceptable. And our biggest power is in the voting booth, right? So not to get political, but we need to think about it. Medicine should not add to the illnesses of humans or the earth. And medical care should not damage the species on the earth or the ecosystem. We are all in this together. The pollution in China is the air that we breathe. The plastic in fish is the food that we eat. The pesticides and herbicides, we are consuming them, right? And aside from voting, again, conscious consumerism, like Mark was showing, look at your labels. Is it certified humane? Is it fair trade? Is the person who picked these organic coffee beans making two cents a day? Or are they getting a fair wage? Well, I don't want the organic coffee beans if that person made two cents for the day, right? Only we can do this. Thomas Edison, of all people, said this. The doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest her or his patients in the care of the human frame, in a proper diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. We are the future clinicians. Right here, we are this group. So in the 90s, we did tons of research. I'm not going to get into it, but we showed we can reverse cardiovascular disease. And we did this through a lifestyle change. Wanish went on to demonstrate that over 500 genes related to cancer, this is his prostate study, are downregulated through lifestyle change. Transcendental meditation, 48% reduction in heart attack, stroke, sudden death. Butterbur, Pentadolix, level A evidence for prevention of migraines. Acute headaches and chronic headaches statistically significantly improved with acupuncture. The science is there. I don't want to hear anymore there's no science, right? And those ACCME committees need to have integrative board certified physicians sitting there to say this is acceptable or this is not acceptable. Do I sit there and do I go to a do I go to a meeting for gastroenterology and claim to say that's not acceptable and that's not acceptable as a cardiologist? I shouldn't do that. So how dare they, with no one trained in integrative medicine, tell us what we can and cannot teach? Coming out of major medical journals, I'm not showing you anything from the Journal of St. Elsewhere, right? <laughs> So at the academy, we made a commitment. We're going forward. They can have our CME. We're still going forward. And we're hoping that everybody in this room and out there in the world says, we're going to come and listen to people like Dr. Bland and Dr. Perlmutter and Dr. Hyman and Dr. Guarneri, and we're not going to worry about getting that CME. Because while we continue to do the fight on our side, we're not going to stop integrative health and medicine education. And the Academy's task is to bring all healthcare providers together. And when we built our mission statement, we put sustainability in there. We put prevention in there. We put collaboration in there. We need to do this by working together. Not just MDs and DOs, but MDs and DOs and chiropractors and nurses and nurse practitioners, pharmacists and radiologists, naturopathic doctors, Ayurvedic practitioners, osteopaths, the 
the list is endless, PTs, OTs, and so on, acupuncturists. We, we are a force, but we are not a force if they keep us in our silos. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're trying to do. And I invite you uh, to not let that happen. And there are healthcare systems that are out there saying, uh -uh, we're not gonna play this game anymore. And this is a perfect example of one. This is the NUCA system in Alaska. Patients were sick, doing terrible, and the community said, you know what, that healthcare system doesn't represent our values. It doesn't represent who we are as a community. They said, we're a native community. And what they did was they went in and took over the healthcare system. It became customer owned. Look at the results. 36% reduction in emergency room visits, 36% reduction in hospitalization, 95% employee satisfaction, 93% customer owned. This is disruptive innovation at its best. Uber is disruptive innovation, right? Lyft is disruptive innovation. Airbnb is disruptive innovation. We need a little bit more disruptive innovation. So the American College of Physicians, our colleagues, the healthcare sector with the United States and globally must implement environmentally sustainable, energy efficient practices and prepare for the impacts of climate change to ensure continued operations during periods of elevated patient demand. Now they're taking this from, hey, people are gonna get sick, the lights are gonna go out, the respirators are gonna go off, the generators aren't going to work, but they're saying we have to pay attention to climate changes and we have to look at our transportation needs, our energy needs, how, what, what are we doing for waste? What are we doing in our food service? And anyone here who's in hospital administration can look at this and say, okay, let me look at some of the leaders in this area. This is Washington University. They did a health food initiative where they increase their purchasing of sustainable local organic food, 20% of their produce, 67% of their dairy, and 47% uh, of their food overall locally sourced. They said, we're gonna go with meatless Mondays, we're gonna make the meat portion smaller, good. Give people more vegetables, give people more organic vegetables. It's good for their health, right? And, we're going, and they were able to cut their greenhouse emissions by 11.8% equivalent to 211 cars. So imagine if every healthcare system did this. Seattle Children's Hospital, they said, we're going to take on the transportation issue. And look at what they did. They created uh, cycle-friendly uh, areas where people could bike, pe where people could walk. They created, they gave people free bikes to employees who pledged to bike to work. They gave cash for people to not drive to work. They have on-site bike maintenance, discounts on gears from their in-house bike shop. And they dropped the number of people driving to work from 73% to 38%. There's a model, a transportation model with incentives built in transforming the impact that that hospital system is having on the climate. Here's another winner, the Boston Green Ribbon Commission Healthcare Working Group. They said, we're going to come together to get to zero emissions. We're gonna go down to neutral on our output. And they were successful at doing this, uh, if zero emission sources. They hit that number uh, they said by 2018, they beat their goal. And they claim that they saved $15 million, enough to pay for health care for 1,357 people in the Boston area. Okay? So these models exist. And guess what? Guess where I got those slides? By the way, I didn't get to see me. Guess where I got those slides? <laughs> American College of Physicians. Wow. Right, so we didn't, they didn't give the American College of Physicians slide CME. Okay, well, we'll let them know. Now, <laughs> truly healthy food systems will be built on a more integrated, multifaceted, holistic approach, including nutrition, health, happiness, and social and cultural indicators 
interpreted together in relation to each other within the context of health and well-being, food and agricultural systems. This is the Global Alliance for the Future of Food from 2017. Let me show you one of the most amazing models. Fresno, California. Anyone from Fresno? No? One of the poorest areas, yet the breadbasket of the United States, where a huge amount of our agriculture comes from. Yet the people of Fresno uh, were not, didn't have money themselves to eat. Did, they were producing all the food and didn't have fresh fruits and vegetables on the table. So they formed the Food Commons Trust. And what they did was they created a community food system that fought, said we're going to foster health, we're going to have stewardship, equity and economic development, and we're going to distribute the food. The community's going to run it. We're going to distribute the food to all of Fresno. We're going to sell it to the San Joaquin Valley. The money that we make, we're putting back into the commons, and then we're going to start building homes so people have places that they can live. And this is happening right now in Fresno, California. The nation said, the food commons of Fresno marks a radical shift from a narrow focus on the production of food on its own toward a whole system approach in which the interest of farm communities and local people, the land, watershed, and diversity are all considered together. And Mark talked about regenerative farming, the Rodale Institute demonstrating that they can produce as much food organically as can be produced with herbicides and pesticides. So the concept of sustainable agriculture, small profitable farms that utilize uh, renewable forms of energy, technologies that are appropriate to scale, and so on. You heard a bit about that previously. And this is something we all can do. We all can support community-supported agriculture where you pay a little bit up front, the farmer uses the money for the farm, and then that produce comes back to you as a partner in the farming industry. And so if you have a CSA around you, I suggest that you consider doing that, or at least go to your local farmer's markets, which have increased by 63%, right? We're seeing them everywhere. So at the end of the day, uh, climate mitigation is indeed about more effective use of energy, low carbon energy, reductions in deforestation, increases in reforestation, and the sweet spot for us is all of the lifestyle issues which go into saving money on pharmaceuticals. Oh, by the way, you're much healthier if you walk and you don't drive your car, and you're much healthier, in my opinion, if you eat a plant-based diet and you're not having a huge steak on your plate every night. And, you, and for heaven's sakes, don't drink anything out of a plastic bottle. Right? So there are things that we can implement and do immediately, and we need to do them. So I'd like to share with you uh, what we've been doing in southern India. Uh, Mark shared a little bit more locally in the United States. Uh, Ronnie King and I were called to southern India in 2002, and they said, can you help us build a hospital? And we looked at each other and we said, well, we don't really know how to build a hospital. And they said, yeah, well, you work in them, so you need, can you help us do that? And so we started with a one-room clinic, uh, which is now a 350-bed hospital, a Sri Ryani Hospital and Research Center. And now we have three more towers in a rural, rural part of India, where I kid you not, when we arrived, the ground was sticks and stones. It was not green like this. But it gave us the opportunity to look at some of the issues the World Health Organization uh, reminds us is huge, including the number of women dying in pregnancy, right? So we have 58 villages that we care for, and the midwives and the nurses go out to the villages, and they, they find the women that are at risk, high-risk pregnancies, and say to them, please come to the hospital with us. Please deliver in the hospital, because previously the women would never come. They would die in childbirth before making that journey to a hospital. And we provide the transportation to get these women uh, to have their children with us. We had no nurses. The nurses said to us in the beginning, 
Why would we work in rural area? We have nursing degree. We're getting out. We're going to the U.S. We're going to England. We're going to Germany. They, they were already trained. So thanks to Rowney King, in 2006, we started with six nurses. And we asked those nurses, can you give us some of your time in our hospital? We need you. And you can train in the hospital. And today, we have 450 nurses in the Sri Narayani School of Nursing. And the beauty of this is, here's Rowney teaching the nurses a healing touch course. The beauty of this is we were able to give 400 scholarships to share. Right? We want to give people a step up. Right? And we ask for nothing back. And the beauty is we have all these young, wonderful nurses taking care of all of our patients in the hospital. Uh, we have started to grow food, right? This was barren land. We started to grow food uh, to feed 10,000 people a day in the food hall. All of the food is now being produced on the land, right in the back of the hospital. And the beauty of this is we were cooking in stoves that look like this. You know, most women in India are still cooking on stoves that look like that, and they have these stoves in the home, and the children are breathing the smoke in, the women are breathing the smoke in, and now we converted everything to the roof and solar panels. Here we are when we were much younger, planting a tree, and that's what the area looks like today. To date, one million trees have been planted. The entire ecosystem of this drought-driven community has changed. So I share this with you because each and every one of us can do something to make a difference. Uh, we created a zero-waste program. And I have to tell you, we were, the people in this village were very suspicious. Why did we want their garbage? <laughs> they were. And, and the, we gave the big buckets, and we said, put all your garbage in here, and we're going to take the garbage. Well, they decided that they would not put the garbage in there, but they would collect rainwater, which they desperately needed. So we had to go back and put holes in the buckets for the garbage. I mean, this is how you learn, right? Put the holes in the buckets for the garbage, and now we get to collect everybody's garbage, which, believe it or not, women sift through piece by piece by piece by piece and separate out everything that is recyclable. Why? Because we are composting, and we are turning trash into black gold. We are now selling that dirt or earth, I don't like the term dirt, we're selling that earth uh, to other communities. So we have gone from a complete waste to a zero waste site, which is uh, to me kind of impressive. And this is just some of our women empowerment stuff, which I'll go past. But our schools, where we have hundreds of children uh, learning this first and foremost, we have to plant trees. Not only do the kids get to go out in nature, they go out in nature and once a week plant trees. And then they get to take care of the trees and watch the trees grow. So uh, I believe that bringing back some of the traditional teachings, just like the World Health Organization said, uh, the children are learning yoga, the children are learning abacus math, they're brilliant, actually, and uh, thanks to generous donations from all over the world, have a new lease on life, which to me uh, is why we're on the planet. Only humans can do good. Do you know that? Only humans have the opportunity to do good deeds. And at the same time, humans could be the most terrible people, as we have seen through history. So I want to be on the right side of history. And I believe we are all stakeholders in this transformation. And Pope Francis puts it beautifully. He said, the economy should not be a mechanism for accumulating goods, but rather the proper administration of our common home. It is an economy where human beings, in harmony with nature, structure 
the entire system of production and distribution in such a way that the abilities and needs of each individual find suitable expression in social life. We have enough food to feed the world. We have enough water where people can drink clean water. We have to preserve it, and we have to be the change that we want to see. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.